In the next few video lessons, we'll get into some computations and use of equations regarding electric fields. But for now, we're still developing conceptual understanding of electric fields. And we'll do so by mapping the pattern of electric field lines for different distributions of charge. We'll start with the simplest, just a single positive electric charge. We could refer to that as a electric monopole. So the idea of the electric field is, first of all, the units are newtons per coulomb. It's not force, it's force per unit charge. So let's say I make a point in space I call P, and that exists at a distance of R away from the charge Q. The value of the electric field at this point is a definite quantity. The value of any electric force at this point is entirely unknown because we don't know what second charge Q number two we might place here. In fact, we might never place any charge at that point P. There still exists the electric field. Okay, so electric field lines tell us what the direction of force would be if I were to place any second charge, Q2, at this point. But then that begs the question, is charge Q2 a positive charge or is it a negative charge? Well, just as we make a decision when it comes to graphing on an xy axis, we say to the right is positive and to the left is negative, that's arbitrary. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way most people do. We say that's a convention. The convention for electric fields is to imagine what would happen if the charge we were to place at that point in question were a positive charge. Electric fields are based on the force that would develop if you were to place a positive charge at some point in space. So we imagine placing a little positive charge right here. It would accelerate because of the electrostatic repulsion in this direction. If we place a little positive charge here, it would accelerate but not with as great of magnitude. And the farther away we get, the smaller the force becomes. Well, we can show all of that with just one continuous electric field line pointing radially outward from the charge. OK, and if I put my little test charge, we'll hear that phrase a lot, a test charge. There are two features of a test charge. A test charge is positive. And a test charge is small in magnitude such that its own electric field doesn't warp the external electric field that we're trying to map. So we're envisioning what would happen if we place a really small magnitude positive charge in any location somewhere around this already existing positive charge. OK, so if I place my test charge here, it accelerates that way. If I put it here, it accelerates a little less, and so on. I can just draw all of that again with one field line. And so we get this pattern that emerges of electric field lines pointing radially outward away from the positive charge that we've labeled as Q1. We don't really have to give a name to that at all. Notice that the field lines are uh, close together here. So that's a way of saying that the field is strong or large in magnitude. As we get farther away, the field lines are getting farther apart, and so that's an indication that the field is relatively weak. So the strength of the electric field is indicated by the density of field lines. Okay, And this is certainly a non-uniform field because the lines are not parallel to one another. So what if we were to place a test charge at this location right here? There's no field line there. There's no Well, it's kind of arbitrary the number of field lines that we've drawn, right? Um, but we could imagine that the acceleration of this test charge would be in this direction. Now, by the way, if I were to place an electron right here, an electron is not a test charge because a test charge has to be positive. Electrons are negatively charged, so an electron would accelerate opposite the direction of the uh, local electric field lines. Okay, well, if that's the case, I'm sure you can figure out what the pattern of electric field looks like for a single negative charge. So here's another monopole. It just happens to be negative instead of positive. 
So your guess is correct. The electric field lines then point inward, radially, toward the center of this charged monopole. No surprises. How about we get to a dipole instead of a monopole? So a dipole consists of a proper dipole are two charges um, of equal magnitude but opposite in sign. So we start imagining with our test charge what would happen if I were to place a charge right here. By the superposition principle, this positive charge would accelerate it to the right and this negative charge would also accelerate it to the right so the overall electric field points to the right. If I were to put the charge here, it's the same story. A strong repulsion and a small attraction, but the combination is to the right. In fact, we can just replace all that. At any point on the line connecting the two, there will be an electric field pointing this way. If I imagine my test charge in this location, there's some repulsion and a tiny bit of attraction, just because the distance is large, right? So this force of attraction isn't as great as the repulsion, just based on distances. And so the net effect of that combination of charge can just be replaced with some vector that doesn't point exactly radially outward. Maybe right here it points a little bit in this direction. And then I imagine my test charge here. Well, at that point, the amount of repulsion from the positive charge and the amount of attraction to the negative charge should be equal in magnitude if this lies along the bisector. And so the combination of those is just some net electric field pointing directly to the right. Well, again, I can just make one single electric field line that shows all that. Notice the field line is originating on the positive charge and terminating on the negative charge. And it comes off the positive charge at an angle of 90 degrees and strikes the negative charge at an angle of 90 degrees. That will always be the case. Now where does this field line go? Uh, it keeps going off the screen, uh, wraps around some, uh, maybe it goes across the entire gosh darn universe and ultimately makes its way back around and closes uh, and terminates on this negative charge. There's a field line that wraps around here. Uh, it's going to be too far to draw. It comes back around and ultimately hits here. This one goes around, hits here. We can draw this one. Okay, that's a pretty good map of the uh, dipole field. Let's clean this up by getting this out of the way. There we go. Now, a common misconception about electric field lines is that they show the path that a uh, test charge would follow if it was released. I guess I can connect this one all the way. There we go. But that's not the case. If I were to place a test charge right here, for example, then I can think of a line that runs tangent to the electric field. And when released from rest, it'll accelerate along that path and end up here. And so it's not on this field line anymore, right? Now, if I had released the charge initially, from this point, then it would accelerate along this line. So the field line is telling us the instantaneous direction of force if we placed a, a test charge at that point. But it's not the path that the charge would follow, right? This charge would end up here, and now it's on a different electric field line, and it would accelerate this way. And so uh, don't make that mistake. Okay, it's also not telling us the way that these charges are influencing each other. Some people look at this overall pattern of field lines in here and they say, oh yeah, it's sort of, it looks to me like this positive charge is attracting this negative charge. I see that because of the field lines. No, 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 no. These field lines are not showing us how these two charges are affecting each other. After all, 
this pattern of field lines here is not showing us how this charge is influencing itself. These field lines are showing us how this charge would influence another charge if we were to put it there. But even if we don't put it there, uh, the field still exists, right? Whether or not there's an, a second charge, Q2, does not change the fact that we have an electric field. The value of this charge, Q2, influences the amount of force, but it doesn't influence the field, okay? So these pattern of field lines aren't showing us how this charge and this charge are interacting. What they're showing us is if I were to place a third charge, this Q, in the field, these lines are showing us what would happen to that charge. All right. Uh, these are two charges, but technically I don't think we refer to this as a dipole. But it's a good opportunity to try to envision what the electric field might look like. So for sure we're going to have an electric field that points away. Electric field lines always exit a charge at an angle of 90 degrees. But this field line won't continue like this. After all, let's imagine if a charge was right here. Yeah, there's some repulsion from this charge, but there's also repulsion from this charge, not as strong in magnitude because it's farther away. And so at this point, the net electric field should be pointing somewhat in that direction. Okay, so I've made some mistakes here. Let me erase. So I think we can figure that the electric field is going to start to curve like this. Actually, at a point far away, uh, it's kind of like the headlights of a car. If you look at a car coming miles and miles down the road, it's hard to tell whether it's two separate headlights or just one single point of light. In the same way, the farther away you get from these charges, the harder it is to resolve them as two points of charge, and it's as if the electric field is based on the two of them acting as if there's a center of charge. In other words, really far away, the field line should just point back to the center of charge. So that gives you an idea of how much to make these lines curve, right? So the electric field pattern might look something like this in the region of two uh, positively charged objects. Another electric field worth investigating is the electric field between a, the plates of a PPC. You know what that stands for? It's a parallel plate capacitor. We'll see these time and time again throughout uh, this course. So the parallel plate capacitor has positive charge distributed uh, uniformly across one plate and negative charge distributed uniformly across the other plate. The electric field lines in this case are uniform in the interior regions of the parallel plate capacitor. As you get out toward the edges, you say we have some fringe effects and the field lines begin to curve. In fact, the field lines down here, outside of the plates, will look something like this. In our study of the parallel plate capacitor, we'll often uh, restrict ourselves an investigation of what happens in the interior portion. So this becomes an ex one of the few examples of a uniform electric field. Imagine you have a slab of material with a uniform distribution of positive charge. What does that electric field pattern look like? Well, as long as you stick to points, right, we don't go, let's make a x-axis, 
I'm not going to go to distances too far down the x-axis. As long as we stay close, then the electric field, like the parallel plate capacitor, is uniform. Now as you go farther away, maybe this field line coming out the center is straight, but this one's going to start to curve. Same with this one. This one. So as long as we restrict ourselves to regions close to the slab, then the electric field is uh, very nearly uniform. Now an interesting question would be, what happens if we extend the slab in all directions? We make it taller, we make it wider, and so it becomes, well, could we make it infinite? I don't know. Uh, it's a challenging concept, right? A two-dimensional object that's infinitely tall and infinitely wide. So uh, think in terms of, of limits. Um, in that case, then the region in which it's uniform becomes much greater, right? So for an infinite slab, the electric field really would be uh, uniform. How about a charged rod? The electric field is nearly uniform. From this aspect, it starts to curve near the edges. If my eyeball were to look straight down the central axis, well then from that viewpoint, it's most definitely not a uniform field, right? From that point of view, the field lines look like this. So challenges you to think about what it looks like overall in three dimensions. And again, we can ask that question, what if I could take this rod and stretch it in both directions, right? Make it an infinitely long rod. Well, then these fringe effects disappear, and uh, it seems to be a more uh, uniform or, or symmetrical um, arrangement of field lines. So in um, future lessons, will invoke this idea of infinitely large slabs of charge and infinitely long rods. Although you never get something infinitely long, you could have a charged object whose length is so much greater than the distance away from the object, right? If this length, L, is much, much greater than this distance, R, not just greater than, but much, much greater than, then we can approximate it as an infinitely long rod of charge. Okay. So keep these uh, visuals in mind as we progress through the rest of the material for this unit of study as we start to make some computational and numerical calculations regarding electric fields.